Let's talk JMMA with Charlie Jewett from sogo-kaku.com. This is a podcast about the deep end of Japanese combat sports scene. I'm your host, Shu Hirata from On the Road Management. Now, let's begin. Hey, good morning, Charlie. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Shu. How is everything in New York? Good, good. How is everything in Japan? It's going well. It's, going, uh, it's hot. <laughs> hot. Hot here, too. I mean, you got hot, really hot on the day Itsuki and Naoki Hirata arrived. You know? Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, let's talk about that first, because since everybody's kind of wondering about it, is that us, which is the On the Road Management, and Abema mm-hmm. TV in Japan is doing this project called MMA Training Abroad, meaning that Abema is going to choose uh, some fighter, young and upcoming fighters, less than 10 fights, who believe that may have a potential to become world-class fighters. Uh, the Abema will choose, and uh, they will interview the fighters, and they will ask fighters what kind of things they need to improve on and what they want to do, what team they want to test, and blah, blah, blah. So according to that information, I will go out and suggest them some coaches and teams to mm-hmm. choose from. And uh, I'll tell you this flat out, Abema is paying for everything, all travels, lodging, anything it costs. And of course, I'm offering a pretty good money to the gym and teams, you know, because, you know, I'm asking them to take the fighter for just a visiting fighter for like a month. It's not like joining a team, any of that. And I'm also asking them to do, uh, you know, the privates with those head coaches or privates, with, you know, SNSC coach and all kinds of stuff. So it's all coming extra. So whole intention about this is that you know like a lot of majority of fighters in japan really doesn't have any coaches they're like a player manager and they're really behind in terms of training environment so it's about trying to figure out what's the right training environment and hopefully if they feel that they want to move to the u.s maybe they'll do the second phase of this project which they could maybe come three months next time and maybe perhaps do a fight in the u.s in some feeder show and go back kind of stuff you know so my first question, um, is this the type of thing that's going to be on Abima's YouTube channel? Or is yes, it going to be on there? Okay. I think it's going to be a YouTube channel. But some of the episodes, like, like for, exa- for example, obviously, Tsuki Hirata is a big name right there. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to use a bunch of episodes from these trips into 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu and also to the Sarah you know, Longo fight team uh, on you know one championships and all kinds of promotions too. But yes, to answer your question, all kinds of episodes will be up on YouTube. I'll be my YouTube channel. Perfect, perfect. And um, I was kind of laughing because there's like this trend now. Yeah, it is. Maybe I'll credit it rightfully or wrongfully to Kai Asakura <laughs> going to go train in the U.S. Now all of a sudden it seems like Japanese fighters are flocking to the U.S. to train. But what I laughed about is uh, Andrew from We Are Rising podcast and I were laughing because Mikuru doesn't really seem to be training that much during his training trip. It was more him hanging out on the beach in (laughs) Hawaii and making YouTube content, which seemed pretty different because Itsuki said on her social media, everyone acts like I'm like vacationing in the US. All I'm doing is waking up, training, working out and going back to bed. So it seems like there's very different approaches to the training in the u.s if you get what i mean you know the first very first thing i say to other people at abema tv is i don't want to create some big hit japanese who comes here for just a month and go back to japan tells everybody oh america is this america is that kind of stuff i mean the fact mm-hmm. is that if you come for only a month you're not going to learn the whole thing mm-hmm. all you're going to get is a little bit of what's going on here you know so i'm trying to set them up to be able to train with many different type of fighters as possible so they could feel and experience everything, right? All different type of coaches. Mm-hmm. So this is just like kind of testing. So, but in reality, you know, because of the visa and the cost to live here and stuff like that, it's not easy to permanently move, right? So I think mm-hmm. this is a good project. And if this goes well, then if, if Abema can score more sponsors, maybe next phase we can do a three month of a training here and a fight, right? And if you even do well, then the third phase, maybe they can sponsor, sponsor their O1 visa. So they can move the states permanently. I mean, it really is the visa is a major issue, you know? It costs yeah. about six thousand dollars, you know, to get so, it. So 
on a tourism visa, is the longest they can train like 90 days? Three months, right. Regular tourism visa. You could try to get H1, H2 visa, which is valid for five years, but you could have, only stay here six months. You got to go back and forth every six months. Mm -hmm. So the best is O1 visa, which is a professional visa, which gives to artists and athletes, which will allow you to stay in the States for five years, and you can even open a company or do any kind of work you want. Meaning, if you get O1 visa that sits in the US, you could get a last minute offer from the UFC too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in a position to accept that. So I have a question. So I know you're not the manager of Itsuki or her brother, but you've been close to them during this training. Mm -hmm. Have they talked about wanting to move full time to the US at no, all? Or? It's very, very funny. Like Itsuki is what, 21? Now he's 24. And That's what people need to tend to forget. She's much young. Her name's, she's been kind of popular for a while now. She's very young. Yeah, she's very young. And, uh, you know, when you really look at it, right? When you really, my biggest surprise I have is that both do, do not have a head coach. They don't have any coaches. And they basically almost has zero experience in doing any private with striking coach, any private with BJJ coach, any private with, you know, strength and conditioning coach, none of that. So it's almost amazing to me that Ski has been winning without having any proper training. And, you know, not to insult her, like, for example, she's been communicating a lot with Mizuki, who is really, you know, an experienced fighter, obviously. And, like, for example, Itsuki told Mizuki that Itsuki knows how to do an arm bar, but she doesn't know how to set up to do an arm bar, meaning nobody taught her really how to do, execute the arm bar. But she's been training, you know, she's been fighting under that type of environment. And, and I think because of her little political and sponsorship reasons that she's not allowed to train with certain fighters from another promotion, that type of stuff. So, you know, when you have a female fighter, you don't have too many fighters out there in Japan. I mean, even in the States too. So it just, I don't think it's a really good environment for her in Japan. I think she knows that too. But at the same time, I mean, she's only 21 and yeah. what? She, she's not gonna have that much money to do a visa and come here and, you know, not work and, you know, pay for the apartment, you know, car, whatever, right? I mean, that's a lot of money <laughs> we're talking about. Right, right. <laughs> And she's just too young for her to really figure out what's the right thing to do for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping his young, older brother will guide her to the better thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, so you've touched it on a couple of times, but for those that don't know, so traditionally the way a Japanese MMA gym works is, mm -hmm. it seems, in my opinion, you just kind of go there and you do light sparring a lot? No. Here's what and, Every team they go to, I make sure they go through the same classes as all the pro fighters. So, like, for example, meant, mm -hmm. like Sarah Longo, all their nights are, like, pro training or classes. Like, you know, right. 5.30 to you know, 6.30 or 7, whatever, MMA, wrestling, and followed by kickboxing class or, you know, MMA wrestling followed by, you know, boxing class, whatever that is. So they have two classes every night. And usually on Sarah Longo during the day and the morning, it's like open mat that's used for any privates and all kinds of other stuff sparring. So that's when I book, you know, private with Ray Longo, private with their strength and conditioning coach. I also book private with another Muay Thai coach, that kind of stuff. So they go through whole nine yards of what the pro training uh, fighters would do here. So I was just, I was trying to compare it with like what Japanese training is like. Exactly. So that's a big so, difference. So for example, right? Yeah. Not that many B fighters can do two trainings per day because most of the people work. So they only train at night. But right now when Itsuki and Naoki is in town, I'm making sure they train twice a day. So it's not right. like they're doing the tourist thing. Trust me. <laughs> you, know? So, yeah. you, you know? But I was saying like the Japanese training scene in Japan mm -hmm. is kind of like you show up at nine or 10 o'clock at night because mm -hmm. that's when the pro class is. Maybe a, like a high level fighter or a coach shows you a move. And then you just kind of do some light sparring for the rest of the night. Right. And the, it just kind of, you just do it. You're kind of in charge of your, your own training. You just roll with another professional or another high skilled amateur. You know, it seems to be about as much as the advice as you get. Here's what is the <laughs> biggest difference is um, because of the fact we had the barrier operator photo shoot and we had the NFT project photo shoot. And at the same time, when Itsuki came, I kind of scheduled it that way. So I flew Kanako in. So they get mm -hmm. training with Kanako, Murata, Mizuki, Itsuki. Those are like top Japanese girls, right? And then, right. They, you know, so I kind of want to give uh, Itsuki opportunity to meet them. But anyway, so they train together. 
But yes, the, the, both Itsuki and Kanako say this, the American classes are very, very concentrated on little details of skills. And it's followed by repetitious work, repetitious work, work, work. So, you know, you can learn with your body, right? Mm -hmm. And in terms of sparring, there's a light sparring happens maybe once a week and then do a real sparring, like a fight kind of situation, sparring once a week during the fight week. That's it. So it's not like they do a bunch of sparring every day. You know right. what I mean? so, but the Japanese fighters, most of the uh, training, they do a bunch of you know, light sparring. And after that, they sit around and kind of discuss on what they think they should do or what they think they did wrong, that type of stuff. So nobody's really looking at them doing all these different training and teaching right. them or pointing out any kind of mistakes, that type of stuff. So I, I, they, they both said that, you know, it's just a totally different experience. How is uh, Murata's arm? Did you get any feedback or? Well, you know, I've been, you know, of course, I've been discussing with her almost a weekly basis with her and, and the doctor and physical therapist and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, like all these fighters, you can never be 100% healthy. So right. it's almost a time where she does have a certain pain when she bends her part of this body to certain positions, but you're going to have to deal with that right now. So both mm -hmm. her and Mizuki some sort of in the same situation where they're getting the shots to, to ease the pain. Which they have to get the shots like every three months, so they don't. So they kind of have to work around it. And both are looking to make a comeback fight in fall. Oh, perfect! And actually, a very interesting decision Kanako made was she was in Vegas for four months. So this is what I would love to. I, I wish all the Japanese fighters in Japan will listen to this. Kanako was there for four months in Vegas. She mm -hmm. trained with Jessica Andre and all these, you know, team, for, you know, for Valley Tudo and also Syndicate, you know, like a. a extreme couture and all kinds of different places but all she did was she went to different places also ufcpi all she did was a bunch of light sparring or sparring with a bunch of different fighters top fighters top teams that type of stuff but she never really went through all these classes or sat okay. down discussed with coaches what she needs to improve and blah 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 now when she came to new york she went through with that and she was the first experience she went through those classes you know, all this training, the different the talking with the discussing with the coaches. And anyway, to make a long story short, Kanako decided to take off from Vegas and she's moving to New York. And really? Kanako will join Sarah Longo. And uh, I posted, uh, you know, Mizuki and uh, Naoki posted a video of Mizuki teaching Kanako uh, grappling and striking on their YouTube mm -hmm. channels. Yes. They, they both are very, very good at each other's because, rest, you know, Mizuki needs wrestling and, you know, like uh, uh, Kanako needs BJJ and striking. And they're like such a good friend. They spend hours on the mat, like discussing, you know, <laughs> training together, you know, what to do. So, so Kanako feels being with Mizuki just gives her much better motivation. And of course, with the fact that Sarah Mongo is the team that it's pretty good at making wrestling into MMA fighter, right? I was right. Mm -hmm. you know, and everybody, pretty much everybody there used to be a wrestler. So she's gonna move here and living in the same building as Mizuki. <laughs> So it's going to be interesting, you know. That, that's fun. Um, was she staying in Arjamine Sterling's house in Las Vegas? Yes, yes she was staying in Sterling's <laughs> house. And she so like Sterling has just the random Japanese person living in his house all the time. <laughs> you know what's so funny was the day after Verna Janjirova's fight, Janjirova got injured. She had to stay extra five days in Vegas. She mm -hmm. didn't want to stay in a hotel. So I called Aljamain and said, hey, do you have any room open? And Aljamain was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So they rented a room, and I forgot to tell Kanako about it. So one morning, Kanako wakes up, and she sees Verna Janjiro, who broke her arm, sitting on the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, whoa, Janji's here. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, yes, it's a nice, uh, pleasant surprise when you wake up. Right. But the point is this. Kanako had access to UFC PI, and all these mm -hmm. good teams, and trained with Shevchenko, to underage, to everybody. But her decision was still to stick with one team that could take her to the different level and offer classes and teachings that she needs to be a better MMA fighter. So that's a very interesting decision. That's one thing that I think Kai and all these other Japanese fighter training in America is missing. Okay, so they go show up and do something, you know, join their light sparring session or whatever, a couple of classes. They became a good friend. They rolled together. They think, oh, that's it. No, you really have to stay here a couple of years and figure it out. You know? And that's what... Right. Horiguchi is doing, that's what Takashi Sato is doing, that's what Mizuki is doing. They've all been here for two, three years, you know? Yeah, so it seems like you should try to find a gym 
where you can get the attention you need. Exactly. You can get those private lessons. You right. Can get the advice from the coaches. Here's the, cool, here's the point too. I won't name names, but there are a lot of top coaches I approach because you know Abema can offer a pretty good fee, you know, and to, to take these novice fighters. But I get very respectfully no answer from a lot of coaches. They're just too busy. They got too many top fighters they have to handle. Yeah. And face it, the money they're making from top fighters is not comparison to the money they're gonna make on this. You know what I mean? Right. Like, so it's just a business. So it's actually a challenge for me to find for some fighters to be really a challenge for me to find a good coach or a team. Yeah. Yeah. Do you th- we have a question. Someone wants to know if the language barrier affects the Japanese fighters coming in. You know what? I'll tell you this. All these Japanese fighters who says, oh, language this and language, those are the guys who doesn't step in and actually comes in. They always worry about something before they even step into the game. You know what I mean? That type of stuff. I mean, you really mm-hmm. wonder how – this is my theory. If you want to learn how to swim, you should just jump into the pool. So yeah. it's the same way. So, And I'll tell you this from my experience. When I came to States when I was 12 years old, I couldn't speak a word of English. My father hired me a tutor. You know, was, I came in in June, so to prepare for September, uh, new school year, he hired me a tutor. We worked on it every day. I did not improve a jack shit. <laughs> so I, I went to the s- s- September school year with zero English ability. And they put mm-hmm. me into the secondary, like uh, English special school classes and blah, blah, blah. I still didn't learn much. <laughs> you know yeah. what my father did? You know what? Should choose some sports or music or anything you want to join. Do it. Yeah. I tried to join football, but I got rejected because I was too small and skinny. <laughs> and I tried to join soccer. It was not in the season, so I joined swim team. And I, you know, after I joined swim team, when you're together with this bunch of guys and girls who does the same thing, who has the same mm-hmm. interests, same have the same goals, you're gonna start speaking, communicating with those guys. And right. girls. And that's how you learn English. And I tell you right now, I learned my English from swimming, not from right. classroom, not from textbook. So to answer your question, I don't think language is any problem at all. You should just. I, also, I would also add my two cents where I think it's overrated. Yeah. It's not a real barrier. A, most of the words used in teaching fighting are probably the same in Japanese yeah. and English. Yes. And right. You, you can also show people the move you're trying to teach them yeah. without saying things. So, and I always tell this to the Japanese guys: listen, when you go to English spelling contest, American can't win that shit. Listen, yeah. <laughs> lots of us doesn't speak in the proper grammar anyway. And right, on top right. of that, most of the top team, it's not only American; they're guy from other countries like a Mirab. Right. It's not like he speaks perfect English. You know, it's you guys all same. You know, right. broken English. That's fine. You know, and and just, I'm telling you right now, English, you don't have to worry about that at all. No. I will tell you this officially. Some of the coaches in Japan on tweets, like, oh, you have to learn English to go to America, blah, blah, blah. He's only saying that because he doesn't want to lose his fight. I right. really think so. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, look, look at Shohei Watani. Look at Ichiro. Were they fluent English speaker before they came here? I, no. Right? Well, Ichiro, Ichiro, Ichiro did have that sweet contract where he made them provide him with a translator. Sure, but, right, yeah. but of course, <laughs> and of course, you know, but those translators are not real high paid job. I'm so no, no, surprised no. to hear the money that you know Shohei Otani's translators are making, you know. But anyway, yeah. so but to back to the subject, yeah, language is not an issue at all. I mean, let's try to think about it a little bit. Mizuki and Naoki both come from like the Japanese countryside, essentially. Right. Not like we, not rural, but they come from a smaller city, right. Toyohashi in the middle of nowhere. And their English probably wasn't the best when they went to the U.S. No. And, you know, I tell you this, because of the pandemic, now he had to go back. And now he's back in state. So he was back for almost two years. So his English is not good at all. He's got to start catching up again. But Mizuki, because of the fact that everybody left, she was left alone. She had to mm-hmm. deal with a lot of stuff on her. Her English improved vastly. Mm-hmm. And right now, you know how, you know, like any team you go to in the States, for girls, it's really hard to find a good training partner. So you really right. have to communicate with other girls to get together, that type of mm-hmm. stuff. So like Mizuki communicate with Caitlin Trocasian, you know, like Jillian DeCorsi, all these girls, and they get together and that type of stuff. So mm-hmm. when they get together, it's sort of like a Mizuki is like a coordinator, the boss of the <laughs> girls, you know, <laughs> team in that Sarah Longo. So, I mean, I think that's that's nice to see, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want other Japanese fighters to realize that forget about the language. You can just always come here, you know? 
Figure my last speaking on Mizuki, does she plan to come back to the Japan anytime soon? I don't think she's been home in four years or something crazy. Yeah, well, here's what it is she wants to make a comeback fight in fall. And we thought mm -hmm. about bring, take getting her to Japan as a, one of Naoki's corner man for his next fight. But that mm -hmm. might be a conflict of time because okay. she might have to start the uh, fight camp. And just because mm -hmm. she's uh, been away for almost two years, we're thinking about doing test to wake up. So we right. think we've been putting her into the little hard trading in July and do a test to okay. wake up. So probably not. So big surprise here is like, I've been talking to Merab. If Merab can't get a fight in fall, I'm going to send him as a Naoki's corner man. And I, I think really? he should do a seminar in Japan since he's kind of popular in Japan now because of Mr. Asakura, right? Oh, he's actually, yeah. Um, my wife and her friends all like him. <laughs> it's like because he and like uh, Kai are always hugging and stuff in their videos. And oh, really? The funny I thing was, that videos, yeah. I liked in the videos how he would talk to Kai. Mm -hmm. And I think all of the Japanese fans are laughing because they know that Kai has no idea what he's saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it was just nice to see. It's kind of funny. No, Merab is a nice guy. So he's nice to yeah. But it's so funny is this, you know, when Sarah Long, a couple of the guys on the team, when they saw Merab doing this thing with uh, Kai on the YouTube, they sent him a message, oh, you moved to Vegas and you're going to betray all your teammates and blah, blah, blah. They gave him the R and shit. So the very first day he came back, he saw me on the gym. He came straight to me. He's like, shoot, I didn't know that was Noki's next opponent. And blah, blah, blah. That was before, <laughs> not anything. So, so, you know, Merab is a nice guy. He's just being nice to everybody. And of course, it's yeah. good to meet, you know, interact with other fighters from other countries. So I'm all for it. So I'm fine yeah. with that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's for Naoki's an advantage. So he get to ask Mirab. So how was he? Right? <laughs> Obviously. Now he gets those Obviously. details. <laughs> you know? Actually, the boss, the Mizuki, asked immediately. That day when Mirab had a sparring with Kai. <laughs> really? <laughs> We're texting. I know that. So. <laughs> Is Mizuki's new nickname going to be the boss? Is she going to like come out to Bruce yeah, Springsteen? I the boss now. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. You know why yeah. not? Right. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So I mean, so this training in the world, I hope I'm hoping the next phase should be the three month and the mm -hmm. fight and go back because that makes sense for Obama TV. So there's you know fight show and maybe we can broadcast right in Japan and maybe the third phase should be joining the team, moving permanently, maybe Chiba, somebody, you know. I'm glad you mentioned Dreamers because a bunch of fighters on the road to the UFC come from Dreamers. Mm -hmm. And so do you think now that people see that this is a way to get a chance to go on the UFC, Dreamers is going to attract even more young talent? Mm -hmm. Because Dreamers is not active enough for promotion. If they put okay. up an active three, four shows per year, then my answer would be yes. But mm -hmm. For this one, it's sort of kind of obvious that the problem is the UFC made this decision too late. If they yeah. made this decision six months ago, they would have signed much better fighters. But they right. may officially decide to go with this, what, like a couple months ago? By then, mm -hmm. most of the top fighters had obligations. And a lot right. of guys had the you know, contract and they couldn't get out of. So well, that's why I, it's kind of surprising because a couple of the fighters are coming off of losses. So it's kind of like, really? Exactly, and I'm telling you right now. At first, they were saying about let you know less than ten fights and you know, about thirty years or younger, right? Some of the guys are like thirty-seven, you know, mm -hmm. and have like thirty fights. So it's obvious that I think UFC had a difficulty really finding. Well, I spoke to someone from the UFC reached out to me to try to get a hold of a couple of Japanese fighters, <laughs> and and uh, I'm not going to say who, which fighters or who it was, but I think they had a hard time getting a hold of some of the fighters they wanted probably because those fighters were being managed by various promotions that the UFC wasn't the promotions top priority. <laughs> so maybe they had a hard time just getting the attention of some of the fighters. That's too bad. If they contact me, they expand everything whole nine yards. So they won't waste time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's what well, it seems like the, maybe the people in the UFC didn't know how to go about getting the better fighters. No, no, but at the end, I think they relied on their old connection where they did. Remember the Road to UFC Japan show? They end up relying yeah. on those Shuto people because they end up right. getting a lot of Shuto people in. But the bottom line is that out of Pancras, deep Shuto, Shuto is the worst out of three now, right? right. And at least in terms of fighters' quality. So, but again, but hey, you know, 
this could be a good start if they keep doing this next year or year after. Mm-hmm. Then the fighter can plan, right? So maybe they don't commit themselves during the summer. Kind of stuff. Yeah, I saw that um, the UFC is still doing that Asian scholarship program for the UFC Center in Shanghai. What do you think about that? Yeah, but that's really for Chinese fighters, though. I mean, really, is this really for a Japanese? I mean... Well, they were trying to make it sound like it wasn't just for Chinese fighters, but right, it seems right. pretty obviously just for Chinese fighters. Exactly. I mean, they have this one light, heavy Chinese in this show, which is not right. even a tournament. So it's obviously giving a Chinese guy more opportunity, right? Chance to try to were get you, something going in the UFC. Were you surprised about the number of like Indonesian and Filipino fighters that are being included? Yeah, Really. I, I was mean, kind of shocked. I didn't have my own <laughs> including Indonesia and their expansion. Well, I mean, for example, like I only have one client in this tournament, which is Toshiomi Kazama. And he was actually in before that pound stone. So I actually even tried to thought about pulling him out of that show. But you know, in Japan, yeah. once it's confirmed, they don't pull out the show. So there was a yeah. risk and he lost by a knockout. So I thought ah, his chance is done, gone. Of course, yeah. I said whatever I have to say to Sean Shelby. When he came back and said, like, no, he's still in. And I realized then, oh, ooh, then he's having a really hard time. In the yeah. of the fighters, right? And he went out to get a guy like Sasuke and Koyomi Matsushima, who is already a veteran, you know, mm-hmm. especially Koyomi lost in one championship, you know, type of stuff. It's 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 very different, right? I mean. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And also, they always, you know, the matchmakers' excuses always they, they like finishers. So when you have too many decisions, you don't get the contract. But hey, look yeah. at those records. Who isn't those with a bunch of decision guys? I mean, right. who is really a finisher there, really? <laughs> Maybe except Kazama. Kazama is a finisher, actually, right? So <laughs> what sense, you know? But again, I'm happy this this is happening, you know? Interesting. Yeah, man. So am I. Hopefully it brings some interest to the UFC a little bit. But yeah. Interesting. Anyway, so I mean, uh, so let's talk about uh we can talk about rising Okinawa show. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there's an announcement coming up. I know what date. I should t- tell you this. Okay, hold on. Well, so far is the only fight announced for it that Kai Asakura is going to be on the card. Who is who is what's the announcement? Oh, I know when they first announced I, the event, they said that Kai Asakura is going to be yeah, on exactly, the card. Yeah, exactly. Here's what it is. You know that guy Daisuke Sato who makes the video for Rising? He does yeah. this Instagram live. And he reveals all these things on the Instagram live. And these days, all my clients contact me. It's like, oh, I heard Mr. Sato said this and that. Is this true? <laughs> you know? Well, it's so, probably it's true because he's making the he's making the videos <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. So I know for the fact that Kai is fighting a, a non-Japanese, which is a fighter from outside of Japan. Okay. And I, I am hearing that he may have been an a ex-UFC fighter, UFC veteran. But that doesn't narrow down anything. I mean, there's more than no, a thousand. Not like it used to. Veterans. Not like it used to. <laughs> right. So, and according to Mr. Sato, he's really tough. So, you know, Kai could be losing this fight and blah, blah, blah. But that could be a hype. Who knows? Right. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, June 1st, Wednesday, they want to announce the card. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And, yeah so, uh, I, have the... okay, Sorry? I have a two clients. I have two clients in Okinawa show. Oh, perfect. Time to break out and go to the on the road management uh, website and start narrowing yeah. down who that could be. Well, no, but I, I tell you this right now the two names are, I, I could do one name, Ren Hiramoto. He's going to be fighting right. Okinawa show, which makes sense. That's why Kai is in there too. It's a new market. They're attacking, they're penetrating to mm-hmm. Okinawa. So mm-hmm. it kind of makes sense to bring in those star faces, right? And I can't mm-hmm. reveal the opponent, but somebody that, that he was fought in Rising before. Interesting. Do you, do you think now that the Corona stuff's over, do you think that a lot of these bigger Japanese stars are going to be fighting more foreign talent? You know what? Here's, that's, that's what I want to tell you. Um, obviously, we want it now to fight Kai right off the bat. That's what we've been asking. Mm-hmm. But it's not happening. So they're putting a Kai on on, on an early July show. And there's another show in the end of July. That's where Naoki's fighting. And okay. um, he wanted to fight big name, non, like an ex-UFC fight. You know, because now he's thinking about going back to UFC. So there was a rumor like John Dodson or Samba, you know, who's talking to Rising. So he really wanted to fight somebody tough. But the problem Rising or all the other promotions are having right now is Eagle FC. Eagle is offering a very good money to a lot of fighters. 
So is they, that Khabib? Is that Khabib's promotion? Khabib, yes. Mm -hmm. So basically, rising even though with no restrictions on COVID, COVID, they're really having a hard time nailing a good fighters because of ego FC. Mm -hmm. And it's same for Martin. Yeah. So that's why I'll give you a hint. Mm -hmm. Naoki really wanted to fight, uh, you know, non-Japanese, you know, somebody from outside, but we had to settle for Japanese. Uh, yeah, I have noticed Eagle FC has been signing a bunch of former UFC fighters recently. So mm. interesting. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's really hard to figure out what everybody's doing these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have their own agenda. So that's okay. I, I'm just not going to be excited or depressed about anything. <laughs> I don't need to promote. I mean, this there's event. no shortage of fighters. There's so many fighters in Russia and like Brazil and these other countries that you could get so yeah but you know you gotta understand i got we got clients like gene matsumoto who's like nine and oh like eight finishes and 21 years old who still can't get an interest from me flyway you know because just mm -hmm. just too many guys and a lot of exciting fighters and blah 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 you know so it's it's difficult i'm kind of anyway, glad you mentioned that. yeah go ahead yeah i'm glad you mentioned flyweight because yeah yeah that's what i was just gonna say we should talk about that yeah yeah because deep is having the flyweight tournament and having no inside information, to me, that means that Rising isn't having a flyweight tournament this year. Well, here's what, what it is. I mean, I think Okinawa show is about the star faces. And mm -hmm. I have another client who's making a comeback from a long time retirement to fight in the Rising Okinawa show. Former okay. Japanese champion of a, a Japanese promotion, which I can't get into more, but you can guess. Anyway, and he's uh, a Megumi pretty... Yabushita is coming back. Yeah, that'd be great, right? I, mean, I would love to see it. Oh, Megumi Huji, right? I mean, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but no, it's a male fighter, but who used to be a champion, very dominating champion. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they have another show at the, en at the end of July, I believe, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's where they're going to start the Women's Grand Prix because already uh, Kamala Sakura sort of leaked it, right, on the, one of the interviews that she's getting well, ready. There's been oh. rumors. Sakaki Barra has been talking about thinking about it. Mm -hmm. When Seika Izawa won, she asked them to put on. Because when Seika Izawa is pretty young, so a lot of her comments to me seem like they're things she was told to say. Mm -hmm. And so after her fight, she asked for an Adam Wade tournament. Mm -hmm. And then I just read an article in Gong Magazine with Ray Tsuraya, with Ray Tsuraya and. Uh, kind of occur where she said she's preparing for the Grand Prix this year. So, it right. yeah. makes sense. And for the flyweight, right? I mean, who's the best in Japan right now? Who's not in the UFC? It's got to be Makoto, right? Shinji. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you right now, I'm trying to get him into the UFC. We still don't know. We've been having to communicate with Mick. I'm still waiting mm -hmm. for his answer. So, if he gets in, he will go. If he's not, mm -hmm. then I think he'll go back and do this tournament because I think. Yeah. Uh, Either winning purse or total purse or something like the like fifty grand, which is not a bad for the future show, you know. No, not at all. Not at all, right? And I saw Sayaki post a list of all the flyweights in Deep. Mm -hmm. It is a massive list. Deep has a giant flyweight roster. Oh, of course, right. But then top of the top is Makoto now. There's no, no, there's no doubt about that, hundred percent. So we'll see, right? I mean, you know, but he looks super. You know, wanna... He looks. He looks super impressive in his last fight. Right. You know, I'll tell you something very interesting. You know, to go back to the studying abroad thing, you know, we have about over 200 applications for next season. 200 applications. Fighters really want to train in America. But there's oh, only... this for the, the Abima program? No, right. There's only one female out of so 200 applications. I'm going to guess so it's not Ren Nakai. No, Ren Nakai. <laughs> but that's what it is. I think that's kind of different. It's interesting, right? Guys mm -hmm. wants to go out, try to do it, but girls want to stay there. And maybe that's why they want to stick with deep jewels or do Grand Prix, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that is. You don't yeah. have to say the name, but have we heard of the one female that asked to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's all I want to know. Yeah, I know. Of course. I, I mean, want to make sure it wasn't some like random girl that works at a 7 Eleven somewhere being like, yeah, no, I'd like to fight one day. Legit, and I would love to get her in there, actually. And, uh, so perfect. Here's what it is about. I do not make any decisions on choosing fighters because it would not be fair because I don't manage them. You know what I mean? Right. See, exactly. I'm, I'm, a, I'm doing this as a consultant, you know? So right. that's why in the first phase, there's none of them are my clients. So it has nothing to do with it, and I'm not interested in signing any of them, you know? And, uh, but it's a good project for the entire industry, and I need more entire Japanese <laughs> levels to go up. 
So this right. is a project I need to be involved. Yeah. So anyway, so it, it's it's interesting that only one girl applied for it, while 199 and more guys apply for this. And you know, the rising, they're putting maybe more girls' spots in there with a the deep jewel. So there's a lot of place for girls to fight. Right? Do you think a lot of the girls seem like they're more passive with the management of their careers? That could be it. it seems oh, they're, like they're, they're really not people. thinking that hard. I mean, they're really not hoping yeah. they're making it to the UFC or any of that. I mean, that's, that's just true. a different thing. They get the rising, became half famous, maybe then end up being uh, some kind of celebrity on variety show. That's good mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. Kind of stuff, right? So they're thinking. Interesting. Yeah. Is another no, prop is. For the Abima program, do you have to be a certain weight class or is it any weight class? Oh, anyway, okay. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So anyone, I mean, but it's all, I think, you know, Abima is doing this interview with, you know, coach and a fighter sometime with their parents, all kind of stuff. So there's a lot of issues involved to make this decision, I think. You know? So mm -hmm. I'm only getting the names and what they're looking to improve. And my job is to go recommend coaches or teams and negotiate, you know? I have a question. So, um, do some of these fighters that are like really popular in Japan are they kind of surprised when they go to the U.S. and they're not well known? You know what? You'd be really surprised that most of the fighters understands where they're at. They oh, really? Oh, well, mm -hmm. yeah. So they're not surprised. They understand. Yeah. But they 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 know. I mean, they're competitors. They're athletes. Yes. I mean, think about it. <laughs> So we have a question here. The guy wants to know why there aren't any good Japanese fighters in the UFC. Um, I would say there are good Japanese fighters in the UFC. They're just all injured right now. <laughs> that too, but also most of the Japanese fighters in history, when you look at the entire history of UFC, when all the Japanese top fighters came in, most of them came in too late, five years after people. Um, Go on. Really past their prime? So. Exactly. The when only you say that we're talking that, about like the Takanori Gomi and Gomi, things like that. They're all Oji, way past their prime. Mishima, you know, mm -hmm. Sakurai, all, all these guys, past peak, Yamamoto, keep them all the same. But mm -hmm. there's a couple of guys who came in the peak, which did very well, which is Okami, Mizuga, mm -hmm. Horiguchi. I mean, those three guys did very well. They all came in when they were like age 24, 25, 23, whatever, you know. And also Naoki, even though he got released after two fights, he was he was one and one. Only a loss yeah. against Smash Chanel, which is the ranked fighter. So it's not yeah. like you did horrible right there, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Izuki's one on one, Kamako is one on one, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I think, yeah, it's just a case of a lot of the Japanese fighters that started fighting abroad fought after they were already on the downward spiral. Oh, yeah. Most of them, most of them, right. But that's why I really want the younger ones to go as soon as possible. It's just right. to get experience in there anyway. Even though they end up getting released after full fight contract, even though if they were released when you're age 22, you can always try to come back when you're 25, 26. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just much better. And we have this uh, the, the, the brand, the ex UFC fighter in Japan, you can demand more money. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's just a better that way, you know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, well, he even added the only one who decent and accomplished the same thing in the UFC was Okami, but he never got close to the belt. No, a title think, fight. I think Horiguchi, title fight. Yeah, Horiguchi had a title fight too, and he really got very close. It was 459 well, in the fifth round. Well, I think and, Okami had a title fight. Horiguchi and also, had a, you know. I would count Mizugaki versus Torres as the same level as UFC too. It was a Zufa on WEC back then, which is probably was the hardest competitions in the business back then, right? No. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's same. So, I mean, those three went to the title fight. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, the majority. More than 99% of a fighter doesn't get the title fight. <laughs> they don't get the title fight. So, But anyway, yeah, I agree that recent Japanese fighters, they're doing terrible. I mean, not do well. Not until Taira and Kana Matanabe's win last week. You know, the Japanese mm -hmm. fighter were like, oh, and 10, I think. <laughs> you know, something like that, one and 10, and, and outside yeah. of 10. But, you know, hopefully that's going to change, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have a question. So I feel like MMA news in Japan has really taken it's not like people aren't really talking about MMA at the moment. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's like this anticipation for the match where everyone's kind of put a foot on the brakes and they're just waiting for this kickboxing event to happen. 
Well, here's what, what it is. Obviously, Sakakiba or Rising has to concentrate on the promotion for the match, right? right. So they can't put too many Rising thing before that show because people's not going to remember anyway. You know, they, you don't want to distract mm-hmm. the momentum of the match. So they're going to right. announce this fight card on June first, but still, they're still going to concentrate more PR doing PR on the match, right? And, right. and immediately follow that, they're going to concentrate on you know Okinawa show marketing. Right. So I mean, that's just what it is. But you know what? The bottom line is, I agree with you that after the Bantamweight Grand Prix was over last year, I think Ryzen is taking a break, almost. Right. I, I don't you think so? There's not much anticipation going on. Letting all of their fighters heal? Yeah. <laughs> so all of them are beat up? Like, for example, now I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to watch Kai versus Naoki, right? And I'm right. pretty sure that if I don't want, that our fans want to watch Kurebiru Koike against Mikuru kind of stuff. There are certain fights that fans really want to see, but other than right. that, there's no fight the fan really wants to see. So that's mm-hmm. the problem, I think. You know, Satoshi is just too too tough. I can't think of anybody yeah. who can beat him in the Rising. You know, he should be actually going to the UFC and see. You know, so do you, are they taking more time now? Maybe because they're trying to get visas for foreign fighters to come over. No, I think yeah. I think most of the fighters are considered for. July show uh, is being already being contacted and they okay. know what's happening and stuff like that. So, and, and in terms of visa, it doesn't take that long actually for them okay. to get that process. So, yeah, I think it's just a cycle of how they work. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And what did you think about Takanori Gomi complaining that he still hasn't gotten his uh, <laughs> offer to fight in the match yet? <laughs> and against Sakagibara, I guess. Yeah, posting his sad pictures of his dog and saying he's still waiting for his offer. You know, here's what it is. I'll tell you this. On the record, remember we talked about Shukan Post article and had no effect on Fuji Television, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Fuji Television already saw the, all the spots on when right. that thing came out. And when I you saw have- the response, like the Fuji Television response was like, uh, the match is going forward. And we have no further plans for anything. Right. You know also, this is the problem. In the TV world of Japan, when, when you, once you saw that spot, if you want to cancel it, you're going to have to pay three times as much. Yeah. So let's say theoretically, if you confirm like $5 million worth of a spot, you're going to cancel those. That's going to cost you $15 million yeah. you know, loss on your book. And that's just not going to happen today's to Fish Television, which itself is not doing really well, period. Yeah, so, I've heard, I heard some people say that they're not that worried that Fuji TV would cut ties with Rising because they're losing a lot of sports as it is, it is. like and Amazon Prime and other services. Exactly. And the new management of Fuji TV is, is not exactly a sports fan. They're not really yeah. favors the MMA either. So I can I can give you a bold prediction. I would not even be surprised if the Rising trigger ends up being aired by Abema TV. Okay. I mean, it only makes sense if the landmark is on you next and the number series on Fuji Television. Then landmark, landmark should be only another big streaming service, right? Yeah. yeah. Just for the, my new analogy is Unext is essentially Japanese HBO. Mm-hmm. It they, is. Um, right. They're like the provider of all. They like translate and do all the HBO shows in the in Japan. So you know, I'm gonna t- sideline this right now. Did you is uh, is Unext airing that new HBO series called Winning Time? It's about the drama about the LA Lakers in 1979. They yeah. might. I should check it out because it takes them a while to get it on. Dude, because account, I was watching one of the best series I've ever seen in a while. It's almost like the same level of succession. It's I have to really check it out then. Series because I was watching Peacemaker on there, but that's like a Marvel, like a DC thing. Mm. But um, I'll see if they have winning time. I'm, I'm telling you, but this one, this drama is so. It's you know, not only it's by Adam McKay, you know, who mm-hmm. did the, you know, yes. uh, the Don't Look Up and stuff. Anyway. But they, I forgot the name of the actor, but they have this actor who plays Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. Oh, no, like I've heard of this show because they kept talking about Jerry West or someone was upset with how they were portrayed. Exactly. Oh, my God. The Jerry West, port- that guy stole the show. I mean, sure, mm-hmm. it was a bad portrait, but it's a movie. You know, it's yeah, exactly. creative freedom. But anyway, he's, he's going to win the Lala Award next year, which <laughs> I would not be surprised. I'm telling you, this is one of the best shows I've seen in a while. But anyway, so I'll that's that. Yeah, so... Now, if you go back to the match, you know, so what were we talking about before this? <laughs> do, you think, uh, do you think Gomi will be on the card? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So the, already the spots are sold. Tickets already sold out. 
why the hell do they want to spend extra money to get another guy in there? They don't need to. Mm -hmm. It's already well, it, is already. They still have they still have a couple of fights they haven't announced, right? Right. I mean, supposedly, but they, they my fear is this: they don't need to spend extra hundred k to put Gomi in there because it's already a sold out show and it's already uh, right. You know, it's already spot, so. It's already stacked with the who's who of the K1 and Rise. Exactly, right. right, and that whole theory about the philosophy of the kickboxing, the whole war between Rise and K1, now, Gomi doesn't yeah. fit in that formula. He should be yeah. fighting. If he wants to fight uh, Sakagibara, that should be done in Landmark. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. That'd that be would hilarious. be hilarious. I bet you that was sell, too. If they made a VTR, they would need to have all the footage for when Dana White was going to do the boxing match, the two Ortiz, right? And the show that Sakakibara is actually going through it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be kind of hilarious, right? Someone's asking if Japanese fans just sit there politely clapping during their fights, or if they scream and yell. In my experience, they scream and yell all the time. They do. Um, really drunk people scream. One of the most annoying fights I went to was I went to the kickboxing match. Mm -hmm. I went to a Rise kickboxing show like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was Edeki Kamimura, who was like a very popular fighter back yeah. then, fighting Ham Sohi. And a drunk fan was yelling advice to Edeki Kamimura the entire fight, nonstop, to the point that a lady yelled, shut up from the other side of the arena. <laughs> so, yes, there are loud people at Japanese fights. And oh, during yeah. Corona, when you weren't allowed to cheer because of the virus, there was like a drunk, let's just say, shady figure yelling during one of the fights. Oh, yeah, I know. And they had to post a security guard next to him who oh. every time he would start to yell, would tell him to be quiet. So Yeah, there are a lot of people like that too. But again, in general, right, compared to America, it's a different kind of a, you know, applause. You know? Yeah. That's funny though. Yeah. Is it screaming, yelling, considered impolite in Japan against their culture? No, not in like a concert setting or event or even Halloween on Shibuya. They're screaming and yelling, you know. I would, I would say probably the difference is Japanese fans are, in general, when they're watching the fight, they're quiet. But if something exciting happens, they yell and they freak out just exactly. like everybody else. So they get really excited, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, just, just like a sumo fan, they throw that zabuton, you know, into yes. that sumo. It's same yeah, thing. sumo, if an exciting thing happens, they throw their seat up into the air exactly, and everything. Right. Else so just a, and look at all these Japanese baseball fans. They're like singing uh, throughout the game. It's very I, <laughs> I loved it whenever Asa Shoru, my, one of my favorite Yokozuna in Japanese history, he was like the Mongolian bad boy, for those don't know. Right. He would do this guts pose where he'd smack his stomach right, before right, the fight. Right, right. Yeah. And the whole crowd, it was like the oxygen got sucked out. They'd be like, oh, they'd all be like, <laughs> like freaking out a little bit. So, yeah, they they cheer and stuff. It's just diff it's a different type of cheering. You're right, a different type of cheering. Yeah. So, and I'm sorry I cut you off with the match stuff. What, okay. what did you say you wanted to talk about the UFC Asia tournament a little bit? Yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about that. I mean, you know, they yeah. had a lot of guys in there. We, I'm pretty sure they had a little difficulty finding uh, fighters, obviously. Especially if they have to reach out to you and try to reach out to some fighters. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, back to the screaming, though. I remember mm -hmm. a good example, a recent example, when Saito fought Mikuru. Like, there was, like, women screaming the entire fight, like, both people's names. So, yeah, they <laughs> definitely lose control and start cheering. Uh, I mean, they're crazy fans for us. Like, mm -hmm. there. I mean, it's almost oh, yeah. like it's, it's just a different world. It's not even MMA almost. Right, you know, it is anyway, but you know. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. So, well, at the end, let's touch on this deep July tenth Tokyo Dome City Hall show. I mean, that's the one they're probably gonna do. Maybe a deep flyweight tournament, or maybe it's they have like an August Korakuen Hall show. So mm -hmm. maybe that's when they're gonna do that. You know? This July tenth card is stacked. Stacked. I was looking at the fighters on it. It's like, oh, this is just half the fighters are rising veterans. Yes. And it's just all, and it's not just deep talent, uh, no pun intended. Um, a lot of the fighters are just so much fun to watch on this card. Oh, yeah. Like Daisuke Nakamura just sticks out to me. Oh, Daisuke is um, fighting my client, Mr. Yuta on the Rock. Finally, so, he's back after three, almost three years of absence. 
I saw people were very excited that he's back and they love his nickname. <laughs> yes, and he's been beating all the top guys. He's undefeated, you know. Did he used to be a tag team or something? Well, no. Here's what it is. He's he's a fire firefighter, and you okay. know I'll tell you this: it's really weird in Japan. And when you're a firefighter, public worker, you're not supposed to have a side job. So you're not supposed Hence, to cash a good job example for the fans would be Sayaki fought wearing a mask because he was a police officer. Yeah, or something like that, right? But mm -hmm. so for a guy like Yuta and The Rock, when he fights. He will not receive any purse. He will fight for free because he cannot earn money. Because yeah. it's just stupid, I think. But in return, yeah. of course, you get a ticket to sell, I guess. And that's how I did yeah. the negotiation. But that actually happens to Dominator, too. Dominator was the full, he still is a full time worker, right? Mm -hmm. So most of the Japanese corporations prohibit you to have a second job. So he fought <laughs> many, many fights without getting any purse. Couldn't you do a situation where it's like, I don't get paid for my fights. My wife gets paid to do these fights. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Go, you know, when a lot of athletes, baseball players, or MMA fighter, anybody, when they talk about Shohei Otani, the very first thing, almost everybody says, that, oh, he must be single. Because you can't do that when you have a wife and kids. You know what I mean? Like, you can't do it two way. You know what I mean? That's yeah. like the same thing. Your wife, your, your wife is earning money. That would be hilarious. Yep. But anyway, so back to Utah Rock. So what happened was Utah and the Rock, he's, he has a little uh, transfer between the sections. So he's in a different department now within the fire department, which will give him more free time to train. Oh, perfect. Now, so, so he can uh, fight more actively, like maybe three times a year. So he's in that situation now. So my job is try to get him a fight, which a win will lead him to rise in. So I thought and that Daisuke Nakamura is a good matchmaker, right? I mean, it's to perfect because Nakamura is like riding this hot streak where everyone's talking about him. He's right. the fans love him. So win over him puts you and everyone is a great optically. It puts you in a good spot to go right. into the rising. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I think that's the good match for Utah and The Rock. If he beat Mr. Nakamura, then I think I can campaign to try to get him to, uh, to rise in, mm -hmm. right? Only makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Maybe. really, I mean, when you really look at this UFC Asia tournament, those guys face, I mean, Utah and The Rock is qualified. Even though he's not that young, he, he look at the record, right? I mean, yeah. yeah but, Jamie yeah. said he'd rather not see Kitoka fighting again. Yeah. I don't know if I want to see him get brutally knocked out again. Hopefully, he oh, does better no, in this fight. No. I hate to tell you this, but ever since he fought Jorge Masvidal in Sengoku, you remember that? Yeah. Fight? When he went mm -hmm. for the insisted on leg locks and observed many, 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 many punches to his head, I think he changed from that fight. I really think so. Well, yeah. watching his fights is almost stressful because yeah. he so frantically goes for the takedown. And, the leg and leg. when it fails, you know what's going to happen. Right, and and he just insists too much on leg locks, which is just too right. risky in MMA. Right, this is, that's the one thing. It's very interesting when you go like Sarah's to see grappling training. A lot of grapplers go for leg locks, but MMA fighter doesn't. You know, so I actually saw one brown belt guy who rode with Naoki, and Naoki gets tapped out in one minute, and after that, tried it again. He gets tapped out in two minutes, but both yeah. time he went for the leg locks, which just not really Naoki's not used to. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a different kind of a training there. Right. Interesting. Yeah, so I hope Kitamura, I agree. I don't want to see him getting beat up anymore. How I mean, old? Other, oh, he's got to be in his mid-40s now, isn't he? Almost, yeah. I mean, see, that's the one guy on the... who could have gone to UFC. Or I know he had an offer from Bellator mm -hmm. and stuff, but it was back then when Dream was around. It was paying relatively okay money. A better than, little better than Bellator. That's why he didn't take that offer. So he, he just, one of those guys that just had the chances to fight outside Japan and just did it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of guys like that, you know? Out there. Oh, yeah. That, especially from that time period, people that felt like they had a responsibility not to leave their promotion. That too, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised, a lot of Japanese fighters say that they prefer fighting in front of all these people who has been supporting them. But when you go outside of Japan and fight, they don't get to go and watch their fights. Which is, I mean, to me, I don't know, that's kind of ridiculous. And to, you know, you can watch it on the internet anyway, right? So, 
Let's see, yeah. I got a comment. WMMAC now says deep and deep jewels need to make all of their fights three rounds instead of two and drop the must decision. I disagree. I used to agree with you, but a lot of the fighters on the undercard, especially, don't really train that much. And so they feel they're more exciting if they fight in a two round fight. And I love the must decision because Jules, 10 years ago, every fight was a draw. And it was the most infuriating aspect of Japanese MMA. So must decision is a good way for them to have to pick a winner. Yeah. You know, but the lower tier of deep jewels, they're not really a professional level fighter. They're like the actors right. in the US. Really. I mean, so, but I guess, yeah, I, I see what the MMA scene now is saying too, though, because you don't want to hand the loss to a very close fight on two round fight. Well, I agree, but yeah. my opinion of it changed when I was speaking to Hitomi Akano once because I was all about it being three rounds. Mm -hmm. And she said she preferred two rounds because she thought it allowed her to be more exciting to go for stuff that she might not go for in a three-round fight and to more aggressively chase the finish. That, I that made sense that. to me. So, yeah, that makes sense. But maybe they should create the extra round if fights is really, really close. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, no, see... That's the reason I don't like that is because Jap because this is what happens in shoot boxing. And yes. when judges know there's the extension round, they now refuse you, to make a decision. You remind me of Mizuki versus Ai Takahashi. <laughs> extension round number one. Extension round number two. Right. I mean, extension they round number three. That fight, you know? like, yeah. yeah. They were just waiting until there was a round that I looked like she could have won it to give Ai Takahashi the round. Right, right. right. But Course, no, but I don't like the idea of extension rounds because historically Japanese judges rely on that to not make a decision. That's true. That is very true. Yeah, okay. Uh, you want that? <laughs> I understand what what, yeah. I mean, what WMA scene is saying, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I've seen when they didn't have much decision and what it led to was a bunch of draws, which is why a bunch of older Japanese female fighters have an insane amount of draws on their records. They do, yeah, they do, yeah, which is not good. Mm -hmm. But I wish they do three round fights too, though, because that's you know because in America that would be considered as exhibition. You won't even count it as a, you know, three round fights for like the title fights. Now, the way that you can get a three round fight is you can kind of do it. Megumi Fuji did, mm -hmm. and you can fight in deep and deep jewels. And if you get big enough, you can tell deep. I I only want to do this. Right. I so mean, when Megumi fought for them, she was like, I'm only fighting under unified rules. I'm not going to do the stupid no elbows to the ground yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Back so, then, the, like, yeah. cats against on the pound or whatever that is they had, right? So, yeah. So, deep and deep jewels. If you're a big, if you're a fighter, you can negotiate to get different rules if you have that kind of negotiating power. The only one is Seika Izo now, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seika's brother works at the Deep Jewel's office now too, full time. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I saw she was working at the event, so they're both pretty busy. <laughs> She's working at the event? She shouldn't be working at the event. You know? mm -hmm. Did uh, Kita Oka ever get a chance in Strike Force? Uh, I don't think you know. He never fought in Strike Force. Strike Force would have been. What is it? That was Kawajiri. That was Kawajiri. Kawajiri um, and uh, what's his name? Aoki. One more, the guy who is uh, who works for Okami now. God, I forgot his name. Why? Is it Miruta, Murata? Or uh, he's, or? He's, yeah, he's from Shuto. I just remember it was the most depressing Strike Force card of all time because it happened shortly after the major earthquake in March. Yeah. And all the Japanese fighters, I mean, Kawajiri got smashed by Gilbert Melendez. And, right. And uh, Strike Force also booked uh, famous Hitomi Akano to fight Chris Cyborg. Yes. And also in the Challenger series, they had Tama-chan fighting Shayna Baszler. Was Hiroko Yamanaka, wasn't she also a strike force? No, I think she was an Invicta. No, no when Hiroko fought Cyborg in Strike Force, and that's when, oh, that's yeah. when Cyborg popped yeah, for steroids. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I interviewed that's right, Hiroko, yeah. and I was like, do you think Cyborg is doing steroids? And she said, yes. <laughs> It's like well, the most really obvious back then that it's like they couldn't find anybody to fight cyborg, so they right. went for the Japanese, you know, go for the old Japanese dominatrix that had a couple of fights left on the table. Yeah. But oh, Ishida Mitsuro Ishida is another guy who fought in Strike Force, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And if you count Maximo Blanco in there, he fought Pat Healy, 
in Strike yeah. Force, right? So I miss Strike Force. Strike Force was fun, but interesting. Yeah, right, yeah, so yeah. do you have any prediction? Let's close on this. We talked about the rising Adam Wake Grand Prix a little bit. Do you have any? It seems like Kana Asakura is going to take part. Yeah. Do you have any other predictions for people that'll be in it? Uh, of course, Seika Izawa, obviously, yeah. right? And uh, well, so I do can't... you think they put her in the tournament or do they make her like the prize where the winner of the tournament fights her? I think the pr prize, I think, for the win winner of the tournament. And I'm still waiting okay. for the uh, details because we have one client who is probably going to be in this tournament and she's actually a former uh ufc fighter and had some titles for the major promotion in the u.s in the past so they are going to book a couple i think you know no names from outside japan yeah you know? so the way i would suspect i would almost it seems like historically a lot of these tournaments they tend to put like Half Japanese fighters, half foreign fighters. Yeah, and see exactly. what happens. It's, eight, it's four Japanese, four non-Japanese. Right. So yeah, and but and I would. I only know a few names in this tournament, but by by looking at that, I think Izawa has to be one of the favorites, right? And so I have a question. Now that they fought twice, do you put Ayaka Hamasaki in the tournament, or okay. do you just save do you save her for super fights now? No, I would, but the point is, I think Ayaka probably would say no. Okay. I don't think she would. I mean. She might even retire. Who knows, right? At this point, but I don't think she, think she should rush into something like Grand Prix. You know, right, right. But as okay, a promoter, so, if I'm a promoter, I do, I will offer her. You know, mm -hmm. but I think another girl is obviously Reina. They're gonna try to put her in there. Can she but even I make the weight? Can exactly. she make the weight? But not only that, maybe Reina's decision would be no too, because that Grand Prix may not be the right place for her. Right? I mean. I saw her at Deep Jewels. She is a lot bigger than Saudi Oshima and the other Adam weights that walk around. Really? Just height wise, she's tall for the weight division. And I think her most recent fights have all been at like 51 kilo or something. That's true. Right, right. Yeah. So if you're making the tournament, let's think. Let's put a little our rising matchmaker hat on. You have Kana Asakura in it. You clearly have Seika Izawa. That leaves a couple more Japanese fighters. Do you put a Miyu Yamamoto in it because she's fa super famous, or and gets attention, or do you go for someone like Saudi Ashima and Miki Matono? You know, it's funny you said that. You know, I had a about six months ago. I had a meeting with people from Yahoo Japan. They have yeah. their own matrix to decide who is popular or no, huh. who gets more click or bait, you know, page views. For and, people that don't know, Yahoo is the number one search well, engine in Japan. In Japan, right. And uh, Miyu Yamamoto has a very high score. She does. Yeah, she does. It's just very surprising high score compared to even like Naoki's very low compared mm -hmm. to that. You know, like I'm talking about this general public recognition. Well, see, I, um, I monitor Google Trends. Mm -hmm. And Miyu, who does relatively little to boost her own name, mm -hmm. is consistently very high. Exactly. So mm -hmm. for that alone, I don't think she should be in there as a competitor because she's not up there yet. And I will use her almost super fight and stuff like that. But just for that, her recognition level alone, I will put, offer her a spot. So I would do, if it's for Japanese, it got to be Seika Izawa, right? Mm -hmm. Reina, Kan Asakura, and Miyu Yamamoto. That's it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. all we got. And we give back oh. after a break. You know? I would almost have Mia come in and be a commentator for it. She was very good commentating for the Olympics. Exactly, right. And I this is just to go on to her popularity, but I was watching, there was a TV program where they were talking about women that married famous athletes. Mm -hmm. And she was on it. You know, there was, it was athletes who married athletes. Right, right, right. right. She, she was on it, and so was Shizuka Sugiyama because mm -hmm. they're both married to athletes now. Exactly, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you do you did you see the program I'm talking about? No, I, I but I did hear about it. No, I did not. See there it. was, right. I there was an Osaka boxer from a long time ago, mm -hmm. whose wife was on it, and this is gonna be a terrible story because I don't remember his name, but she definitely stole the show because her opening story was the first time she met her husband, he was drunk, naked, walking around a hotel room in Osaka. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, I was like, ah, oh, yes, the Osaka fighters oh, are definitely not the same God. as the Tokyo fighters, but. Right. Yeah. No, so yeah, Miyu Yamamoto is insanely popular for for not doing much to boost right. her name. 
and, I and obviously in yeah. uh, opening rounds, you know, just like how like Pride did back then, they put out Gomi against Kaji right on the opening round. Yeah. I would create like one or two big match on the first match. Yeah, I will put Izawa against somebody big name from America. No, yeah. and I will put last... to somebody some rematch. Who did she fought? Kana, you both, right? That right. both makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm thinking about the fight as a fight against the other Japanese. You know? Interesting, yeah. So I mean, even well, the foreign fighters, yeah. Rising's done a good job of finding the good foreign fighters. Maria's exactly. in the UFC now. Right, she looked yeah. very good when she fought in Rising. Exactly. So I mean, I think you should be able to find somebody. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and, and and the fact that Eagle FC is not signing girls, <laughs> you know, it's not like that much competitor, right? It's not like the Invicta is paying big big money too, so. Well, I mean, they just asked where they bring in foreign talent like Zapatella. Zapatella's already fought for Ryzen, right? And she was beat by Kana Sakura. And I think it's she's very, awesome. very adamant about staying at strawweight now. She doesn't want right. to go to atomweight. Yeah, I think she's going to strawweight, right? Yes, yeah, she is. Uh, but you, know she, you represent the Invicta strawweight champion. Exactly. What are her... I mean, here, no, not strawweight, the atomweight. The Jessica I'm talking about the atomweight the... champion. Right, no, I mean, I would love to put Jessica Derboni in there on the Grand Prix, but that's not yeah. going to happen because she's a champion. She's probably going to fight Invicta in summer. Ball, so but that you know, I think right now women's super fight has to be the Izaka Izawa versus Derboni, right? I'm sorry, yeah, that'd be fun. Izawa versus Derboni would be really fun, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think Derboni will be fighting maybe G and De Corsi for title next. Who knows, right? She's up there. Talk about an impressive win over a rising veteran, you might add. Um, yeah, Jillian, not that was a crazy knockout, yeah, she knocked out Lindsay Van Sant, who beat Reyna, right. In, yes. in in Bellator, and right. Itsuki Hirata had a sparring session with Miss Julian De Corsi this past Saturday, which is yesterday. So she's getting yeah, really she's, good experience here. You know, she's a fun follow on Twitter. She seems to have some fun interacting with her fans and stuff. Right, and 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 the fact that like she she comes here, she get to train with, take out classes by Algermain, classes by Matt Fredbola, get to roll with Kato Intrication, do real serious sparring with Julian De Corsi. You don't get that. To do that in Japan, right? Yeah, so, so they're getting experience, I think. You know, perfect. Yeah. So I think that's it for today. Yeah. So when is the match again? June nineteenth or something like that. All right. So we'll have a show before then. Maybe yes, we'll do yeah. next session. We can really get into the details of the match and go over some of the more exciting matchups and the the lead up to it. Sounds good. All right. All right, we'll see you you guys then. Bye-bye.